We're doing air quality. Um, so we have a couple of sources of pollution when we talk about pollution overall. Um, and the first one would be um, we have a source that is a primary pollutant or we have a secondary pollutant. Um, so primary pollutants are pollutants that are uh, directly emitted into the air. So we would say that they have direct emission. Versus our secondary pollutants are pollutants like ozone or some other particles. Basically, it takes a secondary me uh, mechanism in order for them to get into the air. Um, so it's more difficult to assess exactly how they're created, um, or we need to limit other things like our primary pollutants in order to limit our secondary pollutants because it's harder to put on regulations for our secondary pollutants. Um, so our secondary pollutants, indirect, um, indirect pollutants, they really have formation that happens in the air. So um, you have to have, um, basically you have to have some reactants in order to form this product, going back to chemistry. So we'll talk a little bit about ozone. That's one of our major secondary pollutants. Um, and we'll talk about smog. Um, so those are key ones that we actually tend to be pretty familiar with when we're talking about air pollution. But um, overall, those are our big secondary pollutants. We still need to have regulations for them, but they're a little bit more difficult to regulate just because they aren't uh, immediately emitted into the air like our primary pollutants are. Um, so that tends to cause a little bit sometimes of an issue, or at least it's a, um, it just causes a little bit of a challenge um, for us to be able to regulate and effectively treat those. Um, and the next thing is how we do this. We use um, what's called the Air Quality Index, also known as the AQI. Um, so different uh, companies, um, the government, um, keeps track of air quality indexes. Um, so I found a site called iqair.com. There's also um, EPA governmental sites. iqair.com actually happens to do um, uh, global things, so we'll look at that momentarily. Um, but our air quality index is relating our daily air pollution concentrations um, for our criteria air pollutants um, measured in a particular geographical area uh, to concentrations of our air pollutants overall. So it's a, it's a relative number, and the numbers here are generally at zero to 500. By generally, I mean that is the range. Um, so it's a relative scale. And um, a key bit of this is it's a number, uh, it's a dimensionless value. So when we are talking about them as this like combined number, uh, we're not necessarily looking at how much exact carbon monoxide do we have, how much exact ozone do we have, how much exact particulate matter do we have. Most of the time, uh, that's a combination of all those. So we get this um, really unhelpful value in one sense um, because it's like two. What does a two mean? A two is actually really good. Most places don't have an air quality index of a two. Most, most uh, good air qualities hover around like uh, 15 to 30 or so. Um, and as you increase in your number, you're getting worse air quality. And it's a um, combined number, zero to 500. It's a combined number of all of our criteria air pollutants that are contributing. Yeah? How do you measure something that's dimensionless? How do you measure something? That's like dimensionless. How, like, how do you get that number? Um, other people have done empirical formulas to figure out what this number is and to make it usable. Um, so it's not just a number that sits and is like, okay, well, what does 500 mean? Um, they are um, considering um, how much ozone contributes to human health. Um, the tropospheric ozone um, contributes to human health. How much um, CO2 contributes to human health. Um, so there's some factors in there that are probably a little bit past this class that actually go into what the real number means. But we are actually going to look at this particular site because it's quite fun. Um, or I think it's quite fun. You don't have to think it's quite fun. Um, so let's bring, let's bring us back over here. Okay. We're going to share this one. Yes. Awesome. Okay. I want to see that. Okay, so this is Cedarville's. Um, so this is on iqair.com up at the top. This is our air quality today. Um, it was taken at 10 a.m. November 11th. Um, and in this particular site, we can look at the US AQI, which is how we're measuring it. So we're at 21, which is really good. Um, that's why it's green and it says good. We like that. Green generally means good. Um, and you can look at these other factors in here. So the pollutants that are contributing to today's maybe poorer quality of air, but it's not really poor quality, but the things that are basically making it not zero, 
um, are PM 2.5, so we have some dust particulates in the air. Honestly, it's probably because we're in corn harvesting season, um, and so there's a lot of corn dust that's around. Um, it doesn't look like they're doing a whole lot of corn um, like removal today, otherwise our pollutant level might be a little bit higher. Um, and it can give us our concentration, so I'm not actually sure where they've measured this specifically from, uh, but someone is doing some measurements here, or at least tracking it maybe in the Dayton area, and then they're projecting it onto um, basically based on winds and that kind of thing from uh, or what happens in the Cedarville. Um, but you can look at all these. This has a projection, so it has our forecast of what we expect it to be. So today our high is at 55. Um, tomorrow it will be similar. Um, but we're in pretty reasonably good air quality um, deals. If we come over here to what they're calling the pollution map, this is showing us all the surrounding area. So here is Xenia. Cedarville's a little too small to actually be on this map um, at this level. So we're just going to keep zooming out. Find your hometown. Find places that, uh, who's from Boston? Kai? Kai? Yeah. I was looking at Boston the other day. I had higher expectations of Boston. Um, I thought actually that you would have worse air quality than you actually do. Where is it? I'm not actually good at finding things. Sorry. I, I expected Boston to have worse air because it's a city, um, but it actually looked like relatively fine. Um, so there's a lot of things going on on this city, or not on this city, on this map. Um, so the little white streams are wind. Uh, you can see there's fires that are noted. So fires actually significantly contribute to our air quality. If any of you guys have been around fires or been in ashy areas, it's uh, very unpleasant. What about like the fires that are like in the Amazon or like you know Brazil? Hmm. Let's go down and see it. They actually do the entire world down here. Um, so you mean like these fires? All down in here? I don't know how to say any of these terms. You're going to have to help out with that. Um, but yeah, so there's a ton of fires down here. And actually, it doesn't look like they're significantly contributing um, because our air quality is generally not super terrible. Like we have 12, 6, 42. If we're on a scale of 0 to 500, like these are actually pretty solid. Um, so maybe we aren't measuring it as um, attentively as we could because you can see there's lots of fires in here um, and there's not a lot of station points with 12 and 6 and maybe 15 over here. So we don't have a lot of points that we're actually getting, um, but potentially that means we could do a little bit better job of actually getting those. If we come over to Africa and Europe, especially looking at India. India and China tend to have really, really poor air quality, just as a rule. Um, so you can see in here, 211, 213. Um, this is over in our Uzbekistan's area, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, all those. Um, so those tend to have really poor air quality in part because they have different regulations than like what the US has. Um, and they also, um, they have different geography. Um, so how the wind moves along the land over there looks a little bit different. Um, therefore, when, um, when it has poor air quality, some of it sits a lot longer than it does in the US where we have a lot of really open plains. Uh, China looks a lot different too. They definitely have some different regulations. Um, but you can see this is a, I actually li really liked this resource. It was better than what I thought the, some of the government resources were because um, it does the whole world. Um, but so this will be online if you guys just want to check it out afterwards. But um, this is kind of an example of what our air quality index looks like worldwide, internationally, um, overall, all of those things. Yeah. Uh, so it's a conglomeration of all of our criteria air pollutants. So we're looking at ozone, we're looking at uh, CO2, um, we're looking at methane, all of those that are contributing to what, uh, especially particulate matter, um, what contributes. Um, so I don't have the empirical formulas for how we're going from 0 to 500 and the exact number there. Um, but someone has come up with an empirical formula that relates those concentrations if we want to come over to somewhere in India. 262. Um, let's see. I actually want to go back to, let's find in India, oh, Pakistan, my bad. So they're at level hazardous over here. That's the city we were just looking at. Um, so their big pollutants that they have, their concentration of PM 2.5 is 255.2. That's not the exact same number as our 306 over here, but there's some correlating factor between their amount of particulate matter that's significantly contributing to their health um, and the hazardous level of our air quality index. It's really just a helpful value so that we don't have to look at all the individual concentrations. Yeah. So like if methane is worse for you, even if there's a smaller amount Mm -hmm. uh, okay. mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. 
cool stuff. All right, let's go back to this shindig. Let's see. There we go. Yes. OK. So that's our air quality index. Uh, you can look at it for your hometown. Um, as long as it's bigger than a village, about 1,000 people or so, especially in the US, um, we'll probably have information for it. Um, big cities are definitely more regulated. They, they need to have those numbers, um, especially ones that are a little bit more industrial based. Um, Cedarville, probably not as regulated to be reporting its air quality index um, or specific values. But Dayton, uh, or industries around Dayton, definitely would be. Okay, so in this, one of our big sources of pollution has to do with photochemical smog. So we don't really call it photochemical smog most of the time, but that's what it is. Um, so the photo portion is talking about photosynthesis, and the chemical means we have a chemical reaction. Smog, we'll get to what smog is. Um, but our, um, our ozone is a precursor to the formation of smog, uh, which is most of what contributes to our, um, our overall air quality when we think about air quality. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're right in your thinking, um, because there's a lot of particulate matter, there's a lot of uh, nitrous oxides um, uh, and sulfuric oxides that actually contribute to our air quality as well. Um, but smog does play a really big role, especially in our larger cities. So when we're talking about formation of smog, photochemical, we need to have photo part, which is going to be our sun, and we need to have the chemical part, which means we're going to have a chemical reaction. So when we have reactive hydrocarbons, which we talked about these as um, volatile organic compounds or volatile organic matter, so our VOCs, but at reactive hydrocarbons, when they add with our NOx, so this is our nitrous oxides, in the presence of sunlight, they can form ozone and some other things that are important, but not quite important enough for our analysis in this class. Um, but the main thing that they are forming over there is our ozone. And we talked about um, the, the difference between stratospheric and tropospheric ozone the other day. Um, so when we look on, a, this isn't a map, but a graph of um, maybe. I changed the page. There it goes. Um, so the height basically from the Earth, so if down here is our Earth's crust, um, the troposphere is comprised of really the first like 10 or maybe 15 um, kilometers above the Earth's crust, and then past that is the stratosphere. Past that we have mesosphere, thermosphere, we have other things that go up above that. Um, but the tropospheric ozone is really where we're concerned about. We don't really like it to be in the troposphere. That means you're breathing in ozone versus the ozone is contributing to our good ozone layer. So when we have stratospheric ozone, that is very positive. We like that. That contributes to the ozone layer that limits the amount of UV radiation that comes into the Earth. Um, so when we're like, there's holes in the ozone layer, it means we don't have enough ozone in the stratosphere. But when we're talking about photochemical smog, it's because we have formation of ozone in the troposphere. We do not like this. This is bad overall. Um, one of the major ways that, and I'm going to go back here, one of the major ways that we get our uh, formation of photochemical smog, our VOCs and our NOx are from incomplete combustion, which we talked a little bit about last class. Um, but that's when we don't have enough um, uh, oxygen or fuel inside, uh, like cars. Cars do incomplete combustion all the time. Um, they are designed to do complete combustion but they can do incomplete combustion. So when they do incomplete combustion, we end up getting these extra volatile organic compounds that shouldn't be there. And um, for your homework, you guys are reading about the, um, the Volkswagen um, emissions scandal that happened. Yes? I think so. You should be, should be reading about that. Um, and so that talks a little bit more also about um, the nitrous oxides that are uh, emitted from cars. So. We do emissions controls, especially in cars, because there's so many, especially in the US. Um, we do a lot of emissions controls. Um, car companies are heavily regulated so that the emissions from cars do not have as much uh, nitrous oxides and other particulate matters um, or VOCs. Basically, they're engineered to do well um, environmentally, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So when that doesn't happen, and we're in the presence of sunlight, which happens in a lot of our warmer climates, or during our summer months when we have longer days, um, we get increased amounts of ozone overall. 
generally, that's a problem. Um, so we like to avoid that overall. But that's generally when we're forming it. Um, in big cities with lots of people, when we have sun, so summer months, um, or our states that are like lower to the equator, um, Texas, California, Arizona, um, those ones tend to have uh, heavy, heavily smogged areas. But we also see smog um, in places like um, in the Northeast. Um, and so it's not just that you have to have a warm climate in order to form this. You just need these particular parts, which are sunlight, uh, reactive hydrocarbons, and our NOx. So those form ozone pretty exclusively uh, and potentially to really dangerous levels as well. It stays as O3 um, because it is reactive. Um, there's actually a pretty good section in your book that talks about ozone. Um, so it stays as ozone for a while. Um, I would actually read through that section if you have more questions on it. Um, but it is very reactive, um, and so it likes to be in its O3 state until it can degrade, but it takes a little bit for it to degrade. Mm -hmm. All right, so emissions and control. Um, when we are talking about control, and this is a figure from your book, we, uh, it's okay if you can't totally read it. Um, we, uh, I expect that you will read it in your book. Um, but we have a couple of control technologies. Basically, we identify sources um, of where they're coming from, um, things uh, like your cars or from your stationary sources, like your large industries. Um, and these would be controls that you can put into your large industrial systems um, that limit the amount of overall pollution that occurs or your overall release of a pollutant. Um, so adsorption is one. Uh, we, have, we talked about adsorption when we were looking at our physical processes and our mass balance. Um, so it's the exact same kind of thing. You adsorb the chemical onto a bed. You can use something like activated carbon in order to do this. Um, but it is particularly helpful for VOCs and SO2. So they are transferred from the air to a solid adsorbent. So something like activated carbon. You can use some other um, like plastic kind of materials as well. Um, to be your adsorbent, um, but that's an effective method. Um, you can use bag houses. Bag houses are actually very common. Um, they are um, kind of like um, think kind of like a vacuum. Um, and so I don't know how f like how much you guys vacuum. Um, I really like my Dyson vacuum. It's very very helpful, um, and it has several filters. And that's basically what bag houses do. They suck the air in um, through the bag house. Um, they are literally it's just a housed set of bags. Um, that all hang in something that looks a little bit like this. Um, and the air is sucked through. It can't, uh, the air can pull through, um, through the bag um, and like out the other side. But hypothetically, uh, it keeps most of the particulate matter, other soots kinds of things inside the bags. Eventually, the bags get overloaded. Um, and so you have to shake them every once in a while to remove all the stuff that um, collects on the inside. Kind of like how you have to backwash a sand filter. Similar kind of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. Um, it could be a couple meters tall. Is that a ladder? Like yeah. That would be a ladder. Um, so this one looks, I don't know, probably 20 feet tall. That seems pretty reasonable. It would kind of depend, like the scale depends on what sort of industrial setting you're in. Um, so like how big do you need it to be is all relative. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. um, Biofilters. Um, they degrade gaseous pollutants, so they're used for VOCs and odors. Odors generally are comprised of VOCs, um, but they use, um, they use biology in order to treat certain chemicals, like our VOCs. Um, so you can read a little bit more on this. Um, cyclones. Cyclones work a lot like how our grit chambers work um, in our wastewater treatment. So air passes through um, the middle portion of the cyclone. Um, it whirls around. Um, and the solids will drop out, or the things that are heavier than air will drop out, and the air can continue on, hopefully cleaner than before. Electrostatic precipitators. These are cool. These work particularly well for particulate matter. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> um, but our particulate matter is generally negatively charged. You'll talk more about that in geotech when you guys take it next year. Oh, yeah. Just like in general with these, do they 
like obviously these things aren't just like lying around. Mm -hmm. Like so, do you just have these at like industrial plants or like mm -hmm. factories and stuff like that? And that's kind of like the like, mm -hmm. just industrial uh, plants and like chemical processing plants. Yeah, basically places that you see have really large stacks um, with uh, gas coming out the top. They probably have something like this prior to the big huge stack where you're letting off emissions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're all differently scaled depending on what you need for your particular application. Uh, so electrostatic precipi precipitators, particulate matter is charged by applying a high voltage. A lot of times your uh, particulate matter is already a little bit charged, um, but you would further charge it to like increase its capability of being um, removed through electrostatic precipitation. Um, and then um, the charged particles are forced through these collection plates. Um, it's really kind of a cool process. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't able to find a video on electrostatic precipitation, but you probably could find um, some some pretty cool resources on it. Um, and then packed bed absorption um, it uses uh, the, what's called scrubbers. Um, so scrubbers are like air scrubbers are um, really common um, for chemical plants that already have lots of chemistry going on. Um, and so scrubbers in general, our packed bed absorption is usually using an addition of a chemical in order to um, remove other uh, other chemicals. So SO2 and H3, HCl. Um, so they actually, uh, you know, we are regulating for our SOX, our sulfur oxides or sulfuric oxides, but they actually use that as um, a, a, uh, a means of getting rid of them. So sometimes we'll actually add things like HCl, um, our hydrochloric acid, in order to remove our like worse pollutants, more or less, um, which actually helps us in the long run. It then means we probably have to do an additional method of getting rid of um, whatever waste material that we're creating, which we're creating a lot of waste material with all of these. Um, but it's better than having it go into the air and having us have to deal with it once it's in the air, because it's a lot more difficult to deal with air that is already out there that people are breathing, rather than before you put it out there, how can we manage it well? So a lot of it is about managing it well before we put it out in somewhere that is really unmanageable. All right, so talking about what happens when it is out there. So after it is released from a stack, um, even thinking about like from your home, if you have indoor air that becomes outdoor air that other people are, um, are breathing, are using, um, one of the big things uh, we look at is meteorology and transport. So meteorology and transport is talking about how air moves pollutants overall um, and how it moves in the atmosphere and what happens, how does it do this? Um, so big things here, oops, not stability yet, um, are wind speed and direction. Direction. It's like a vector, direction and magnitude. Um, so our wind speed and direction majorly controls what can be um, what can be let out into the atmosphere, uh, what can't be, at what times, uh, what, where we expect it to end up. Uh, we'll do some empirical formulas that actually give us a little bit uh, more understanding of how this works. But um, overall, um, A, our winds are named from where they originate. So if we have a west wind, that means it's going from west to east. That's more of a fun fact than a necessary knowledge for this bit. Um, but if we have a west wind, it's going from west to east. Um, so if we have a west wind that's taking things um, from Cedarville, it's going from Cedarville to Columbus or to the East Coast, that area. Um, additionally, um, our speeds increase with height. So I'll show a graph momentarily, um, but as we get basically further from the Earth, our speeds can increase. And um, if we have fewer obstructions in the way, so if we live in a rural area that doesn't have tall buildings, we can get greater winds than if we live in a place um, even like Chicago or New York City, LA, bigger cities that have taller buildings, um, we have a greater potential for having higher winds. Even though Chicago is the windy city, um, it would be a lot windier if it didn't have all the buildings in it. Yeah? Like when you did, when you say it increases with height, is that like above sea level? Like it's going to be windier, like I don't know, in, a, like in the Midwest than it is the coast? Or are you saying Not from the ground? From the ground level that is there. Um, I'll show a figure in a moment, it's in your book, um, but I'll show a figure in a moment that expresses that a little bit more helpfully, maybe. Um, but the other portion of this is what we call stability. So stability has a lot to do with um, 
what, uh, what air pockets are actually doing. Um, and so do we have an inversion? Um, do we have hot air on top of cold air? Do we have cold air on top of hot air? Um, and then how does that affect what our plumes look like? Uh, which a plume is uh, basically what comes out of our stacks, our stack um, being the portion that is uh, uh, associated with our, our industry. Um, so stability, we have uh, three states of stability. We can have unstable, we can have stable, and we can have neutral. So when we have unstable conditions, that means um, if we're looking at the vertical movement of air, so not the horizontal portion, um, but the vertical movement, because wind doesn't just go horizontally, um, it doesn't just go um, in relation to like the Earth's curvature, um, but also moves vertically. Um, so under unstable conditions, we have vertical movement of air, um, and it can move up and down. So there is vertical movement of air. Um, we generally see the most mixing and the most um, like pollution dispersion, or just concentration dispersion. It doesn't have to be a pollutant. Um, but concentration of a chemical, um, we see that dispersing the most when we have vertical movements of air. Um, so our wind speed and direction, if we have wind speed that is going uh, very quickly and very um, like high up vertically, um, and then it goes horizontally, we'll actually see more mixing in the vertical portions than in the horizontal portions. Um, so that's our unstable portion. Um, for stable, um, we have really low um, vertical movement, so no or minimal vertical movement of an air parcel. Basically, it ends up being almost entirely horizontal. Stable doesn't mean that we have no wind, it just means that our stability overall is minimized, uh, or our stability is maximized, um, but our, um, our vertical motion is minimized. And then for neutral, neutral is, um, I would like to call it unstable, um, but neutral really is, um, there, it doesn't go one way or another. So our vertical movement is neither encouraged nor supported under the conditions of um, the atmosphere at this particular location. Um, so it's neither stable nor unstable. Uh, we don't have excessive moving uh, in the vertical direction. Neither do we have minimal moving. It's somewhere in between. Um, and that's a little bit harder to characterize than, um, than our stable or our unstable. So we actually um, try to avoid our, um, our neutral conditions, um, if at all possible. We can't really control that very much because that tends to be um, <laughs> something that's outside of, uh, outside of our control. But our stability then uh, informs what does our plume actually look like. Um, so is it going to be really wobbly? Is it going to go straight up for a while and then deposit um, its chemical really far down the line? Um, is it going to be really low to the ground? So that's kind of how we end up using these conditions. Yeah. Why don't we like neutral stuff? Neutral is um, it's unpredictable. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen with it. Is it going to act more like stable? Is it going to act more like unstable? Um, the, it's just, uh, there's a wider range in the middle there. Mm -hmm. All right, this I'm really excited about. So this is from NASA's website. Um, and you who are on Zoom with us, um, you should have the video link as an announcement on Canvas. I'm going to mute it on here so you guys will not hear it through here. Um, but you can watch it. OK. We are going to stop sharing there. Excellent. OK. Let's see if this works. Yes. OK. So this is looking at wind patterns overall in the world um, in 2006. So the guy talks over it, and I'll let him talk. It's a really short video. Visualization compresses one year of data into a few minutes. So you can see we're in February already. Carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas affected by human activity. About half of the carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuel combustion remains in the atmosphere, while the other half is absorbed by natural land and ocean reservoirs. We made it halfway through March. In the northern hemisphere, we see the highest concentrations are focused around major emission sources over North America, Europe, and Asia. Which also makes sense. Notice really how the gas doesn't density. stay in one place. The dispersion of carbon dioxide is controlled by the large-scale weather patterns within the global circulation. Do 
you can see the red is moving down. In summer, in the northern hemisphere, plants absorb a substantial amount of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, thus removing some of the gas from the atmosphere. We see this change in the model as the red and purple colors start to fade. We've made it to June, and there's a significant reduction because our plants exist and are in full bloom all across the northern hemisphere. Meanwhile, in the southern hemisphere, we see the release of another pollutant, carbon monoxide. This is a gas that's both harmful to the environment and to humans. During the summer months, plumes of carbon monoxide stream from fires in Africa, South America, and Australia, contributing to high concentrations in the atmosphere. Notice how these emissions are also transported by winds to other parts of the world. As summer transitions to fall and plant photosynthesis decreases, carbon dioxide begins to accumulate in the atmosphere. Although this change is expected, we're seeing higher concentrations of carbon dioxide accumulate in the atmosphere each year. This is contributing to the long-term trend of rising global temperatures. The Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, or OCO2, will be the first NASA satellite mission to provide a global view of carbon dioxide. OCO2 observations and atmospheric models like GEOS-5 will work closely together to better understand both human emissions and natural fluxes of carbon dioxide. This will help guide climate models toward more reliable predictions of future conditions across the globe. If it wasn't so devastating, I think it'd be a really beautiful video and like something that would be very calming. Let's see. Hold on, I don't wanna yell out here. Okay. All right, let's go back. I don't want to share there. All right, what do you guys think? What's your thoughts on that? Okay, that is a thought. Yep. Right, like it gets so unbelievably dark. Whereas mm -hmm. like Brazil, I mean, it never like there's like that much rain <laughs> for like half a day. So you're so, gonna like, be the only one who survives. But like, does that not legitimately like make his lungs better than mine? Because I've been living in the dark red for six months a year every year. Seems like that could be a contributing factor. Yeah. What do you think, Josiah? What are your thoughts? You're colorblind. Could you see the colors though? Could you see the colors? A little bit. Okay. Could you see them changing uh, at least over space? Because you can watch them move. Yes. So what are your thoughts about how they move? Maybe not the color intensity. Um, I thought it was interesting how I could see the red a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so how it looked like there was a small concentration, but then as the time went on, it kind of like spread out. Yeah, so like what happens on the east coast of America doesn't just stay on the east coast of America. It occurs uh, like all the way over to Africa um, or even to China and then like comes back around again. Yeah. Peyton, thoughts? Um, I don't know what everybody's already said. I mean, not really. All right. Phil? How come it didn't go south? How come it didn't go south? Like all the northern hemisphere was covered, but like mm -hmm. with airflow, wouldn't it naturally drift south versus it really didn't really get below the equator like at all? What do you guys think? You can be wrong, it's okay. It's just wind patterns? Some of it totally is just wind patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Also like, I feel like the continent shape more of the land mass is kind of in the north, like in the northern part of the earth, if that makes sense. Like if like you bisected the earth, there's more land right, in the top like the U Right, I mean like the U.S., Greenland, like you saw in like Russia, all of Asia, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff farther in the north, so mm -hmm. the stuff would change much more dramatically with the land. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the Amazon make up like half of the total trees in the earth? So it would make sense that if like the Amazon taking carbon dioxide out, that it would want to be as concentrated there. That so would make like sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the half the trees on the earth uh, statistic, 
but um, yes, places that are highly forested um, have less susceptibility to like being like heavily carbon dioxided. Um, that's not a verb, but we can make it a verb today. Um, they are they're just less susceptible to carbon dioxide poisoning. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it tends to be a function of geography, um, so like where the land is, where we're actually mass producing things, um, and the fact that. Um, Air is circulated overall, um, but it doesn't necessarily circulate in the exact same concentrations. So what happens on the East Coast is a really easy example um, because they, we have a lot of industries that are on the East Coast. Um, and so heavily industrialized areas, uh, you can put out a concentration, 200 uh, parts per million of CO2. That would be really high. Um, we should do 200 ppb. That would be more realistic. Um, and it starts at 200 ppb, and then maybe it decreases over time, or it decreases physically over space. Um, so what is emitted originally decreases, whether through chemical reactions or because it deposits into the ocean somewhere. Um, and so we're not going to see the same concentration deposited um, consistently throughout. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. There's actually a number of factors that go into that question. Yeah. Cool stuff. Where are we at? We're doing good. All right. Um, so this is on to your thing about the cities. Um, so what is the height? Um, how does the height contribute to the wind speeds? So when we have urban areas, you can think like Chicago. Chicago is a little bit of a bad example because it's really, really windy. Um, but we can think of places like New York City, um, even Columbus, places with tall buildings, um, not necessarily even skyscrapers, just tall buildings. Um, and so urbanized areas, um, if we have this height, um, so 500 meters uh, is what's on the left up here. That's where our urban area sees a maximum of maybe 100 meters per second of wind. Um, so it has to reach a much higher height in order to reach this uh, 100 meters per second wind speed versus our suburbs, our level country, our rural areas can achieve that level of wind speed at a much lower height because there's fewer obstructions. There's fewer things to stop the wind from going that fast. Does that kind of answer your question from before? Okay. Awesome. All right. So going into this, how does it affect um, how does um, things like inversions, so when we have a cold layer um, underneath a warm layer uh, of air, um, how do those affect what our plumes look like? So this is a stack that's just sitting on the ground that has some um, level, some concentration of pollutant emission overall. We're really looking at the shapes though. Um, so the shapes are what are, um, what control where we're going to have pollutant depositing, um, how far it's going to be. Um, so looping is one of these. So this occurs in highly unstable conditions. So we have our three stability conditions. Um, this is a highly unstable condition um, that happens. But looping actually isn't really all that bad. Um, looping, we actually, uh, it's a little bit convenient. We have a rapid turnover of air, um, and they're favorable for dispersion because they result in low exposures. Because we'll have a little bit um, that is at the bottom down here, we'll have, uh, like the same amount of concentration. But some of it will be deposited at the top, and if we have some homes, that are probably not nearly this close to an industry. We have some deposition that happens on these people's homes in this, uh, in a close um, proximity. And then we have movement that goes up. Uh, so we're not losing all of our pollutant concentration immediately. It's not dropping um, just on the first set of houses. Um, it just continues going. And then on another suburb, we might have some more deposition. Deposition isn't necessarily the worst um, because we end up having a wide dispersion of our pollutant. Not that we really want to like, have lots of pollutants out there, but it'd be better if everybody gets a little bit of a concentration rather than somebody getting a really high level of concentration or like one city getting a really high level. Um, then we see hospitalization cases and we have things like what happened with Denora um, and like really high levels of smog you can't see in the middle of the day. We try to avoid those kinds of things. Um, so looping actually isn't as bad as it might look. Fanning. Fanning occurs in very stable conditions. Um, so an inversion means we have warm air up top and then we have cold air that traps, um, uh, it basically traps the plume um, to not be able to like increase in height. Um, so the ground tends to be warm because it receives sunlight in the middle of the day. Um, and then any cold air that maybe uh, 
so like during the night, we have cold air that, that happens, especially here when we're getting down to like 30 and 40 degrees um, or colder and like we were in the negative degrees. Um, but then um, the cold air rises as air and um, the actual earth itself is warmed up during the middle of the day. Um, so if we have warm air that somehow gets trapped up at the top, but we have sunlight that's coming down and warming this portion down in here, we get what's called the, this inversion. Um, so it traps the cold air in between two layers of warm. And we end up getting plumes that look like this. Um, they're very straight. Um, I actually think it's kind of fun, now that I know a little bit more about air quality, um, to look at different industries um, as they are putting out um, their emissions and uh, trying to guess what kind of uh, conditions we have based on what their plume looks like. I think it's actually kind of a fun game. It's a bit nerdish, and I'm okay with it. Um, but that's what an inversion looks like, and that's how it would directly affect what our plume type is. Oops, not here. Uh, we have things that look like coning, um, so it literally looks like a cone. Engineers were great and called it coning. Um, when we have neutral conditions, um, they could be uh, neutral or slightly stable. Um, basically, it starts small and ends up large, um, but we aren't great at determining where the large portion actually reaches a maximum at when we have neutral conditions, because neutral conditions can be really varied. Lofting uh, is when we, it, you can see, it's basically a straight line, like right off the top of the stack, um, and then it increases over top. Um, so we have a release of air pollutants just above the inversion. Um, the air above is unstable, so we have this vertical mixing that happens, so all along the top. We have lots of mixing, but the inversion underneath, um, the, the warm air keeps um, the pollutants basically from depositing. Um, it tends to be um, that increases the amount of distance that um, pollutants take in order to actually deposit on the ground. And then fumigation. So this is the opposite of lofting. So air pollutants are released below an inversion layer, and the air below the plume is unstable, so ground level receptors can be exposed to high levels of air pollutants. We generally try to um, avoid this. So when we are under conditions where the, um, where the stack would have a fumigating plume, we, um, we limit the amount of emissions that they are allowed to actually release at that time because it'd be a really high concentration for the homes or the people who are living or the businesses that are there um, for the city that's very close. Um, if we have a house that is oops, within this realm right in here and right in here, they're receiving really high concentrations of whatever pollutants are within those emissions. So we try to avoid those. Awesome. And we're going to talk about this momentarily, but go over it more uh, next week on Monday. Yeah. So it's like when you drive by like, uh, like a power plant or mm -hmm. like a petroleum facility and they have kind of those like twirly things, is that to avoid fumigation? Twirly things. Like it's on like the smokestack. It's like, is that like to encourage it to go off or something? Or? Uh, potentially. I'm not identifying exactly what you're talking about, um, but very possibly. Um, it could either be to change the shape of how it comes out, which you have a little bit of control over, but not a ton. Like, if there's an inversion in the air, if we have a warm front or a cold front, like, you're not changing what the air looks like. Um, but it could also be to change the height at which um, we release um, some pollutants from. Uh, so if we're doing that, um, then they've probably identified um, that their, um, their concentrations are going to be too high for people who are living close. Um, so then they wouldn't meet standards, uh, appropriate standards there. Um, but I'd have to look that up a little bit more. Yeah. Can you explain what happens with the, uh, like with the inversion again between like lofting, which like stays level and goes mm -hmm. up, which is good, and then fumigation, which like the level when it goes down is bad? Yeah. So fumigation is particularly bad because you end up getting high concentrations that you can't disperse. Um, any dispersion that happens um, in like the looping is we have a little bit that comes uh, like comes down. It literally does a like looping. Even within this, we end up seeing looping all in here. Uh, so we have lots of like physical looping that happens with our pollutants there. So we like to um, have that because it means that not anybody is getting a particularly high concentration versus our fumigation. Somebody's getting a really heavy dose of whatever your pollutant is. Um, your lofting isn't actually necessarily 
better, it's just different. It means that the people who are living close are not going to receive any sort of pollution. And people who live further away, uh, depending on what the air pollution or air dispersion qualities look like. Um, so is it staying in a straight line? These are all showing 2D images. So we're not showing the spread that like would come out of the page. So is it really spread well? Um, or is it like basically staying in a line? That would also depend on like wind speeds and that sort of thing too. Um, so there's actually uh, like there's a third dimension that we're not really considering with what these figures actually look like too, which contribute then additionally to um, people's health and safety. What does that actually look like? Um, but with inversions, basically you have a warm front on top of a cold, or you have warm air on top of cold air, so it's trapping it, um, trapping it underneath. Um, here you would have your warm air here and cold air here. Here you have cold air and warm air on top. That's just an inversion. Normally we have our colder air above and our warmer air below. Because as we're heating the earth with the sun, we don't do it. The Lord does it. As the, as the sun heats the earth, uh, we tend to have warm air below um, and cold air above. Yes? Um, so it kind of depends. Um, it depends on where people's homes are um, or how big your city is, um, kind of what you're dealing with. Um, coning is the least favorable. Coning and fumigation are probably the least favorable. Coning mostly because it's uncertain. Uh, and fumigation, because if people live close, there's no chance for them to be like, there's no like out of sight, out of mind. It is in your face. Um, and then um, fanning. Fanning can be okay. Um, it depends on how far it's going to go. Um, and fanning and lofting actually tend to look pretty similar. Um, but I'd say probably looping is the most favorable, mostly because it hits everybody relatively equally. Um, so nobody gets really high dosages of, of any particular concentration um, of particulate matter, uh, something like that. So I'd say that's pro looping is probably your most favorable with fanning and lofting coming in kind of like a second place, and then fumigation and coning coming in a definite last. Yeah. Um, so on Monday, we will talk about how to do um, analysis and assessments. So we'll do Gaussian distributions. Um, so you can look forward to doing some math. Um, could probably also look forward to doing a quiz on Monday, because uh, we didn't get one in for solid waste. Um, so. That's something to look forward to. Uh, any other questions? Any other online questions? I see you're chatting down here, but I did not actually see them. Uh, most of, ah, Isaiah had, uh, Isaiah and Grace had comments on when we were talking about the CO2 in the atmosphere. So Grace called them the doldrums, which is true. And then most of the southern hemisphere is oceans, and the oceans do absorb CO2. That actually ends up contributing to changes in pH of our oceans, which then contributes to how our sea life exists or doesn't exist. If they're very sensitive, they don't like pH changes. Cool stuff. If you guys have any more questions, feel free to stay after. Otherwise, go have a great Wednesday.